five. We have a government which is rudderless, burnt out, exactly as the Conservatives were in 1997. Four. Normal people in every walk of life, and not necessarily just people of faith at all, are pushing back and saying, no, let's have some reality here. Three. You, Les, I don't think it will last, the extension, because this has been rolled out in a really cack-handed way. Is it a bit of an overreaction? Yes, but it's not woke to care about good manners and decent behaviour on an occasion like that. One. We have lift off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. And we're back. There's a chill in the air. The kids are about to return to school. The summer's almost over. But worry not, because you can, once again, hop aboard the Rocket of Right Thinking, the flying refuge of reasoned views for your weekly trip to Planet Normal. There's been plenty happening since we've been away, Alison, not least the conviction of multiple baby murderer Lucy Letby, a subject you've written on with considerable force. Then there's the Spanish kiss, the astonishing situation where the mother of Luis Rubiales, head of the Spanish Football Association, is now on hunger strike over attempts to oust him after Rubiales planted an apparently unwanted smacker on the lips of a Spanish woman footballer moments after La Loja had won the World Cup. Over recent days, we've seen the extension of the ULES, the ultra-low emission zone, to the outer boroughs and suburbs of London, an event greeted with fury by many motorists. Could this be a poll tax moment when the population rebels? Not so much against Labour Mayor Sadiq Khan, who introduced the scheme, but against the Tory government for failing to stop him. And talking of the Tories' co-pilot, a new poll shows Labour are more trusted than Sunak's government when it comes to tax, crime and immigration, traditional Tory issues. Is the next general election now a foregone conclusion? Are we on for a 1997-style Labour landslide, even though Keir Starmer is no Tony Blair? But before we start, Alison, I have to ask you, on behalf, I'm sure, of thousands of Telegraph readers and Planet Normal listeners, <laughs> what's all this about a Turkish cat? What on earth are you thinking? <laughs> I've only done it to give you material. To gently pour you. <laughs> exactly. Lovely to be back, everyone, by the way. Woo! We've missed you. Yes, so I've been going to Turkey for many years and I always end up sort of feeding brigades of cats they they know me well Liam they think oh, here she that. comes here she comes that's the <laughs> British lady with the sea bass so I've obviously got mug tattooed on my forehead in Turkish handily and uh, yeah a little cat ran into the villa who was clearly being bullied very literate those cats on the Turkish <laughs> coast <laughs> oh, they are. anyway she was very cunning because she picked me out and you know I'm a, a bit of a soft touch so have been going through this unbelievably lengthy bureaucratic process to try and bring her to the UK and yes before everyone writes in and says well are you mad woman there are plenty of British cats down the local pound yes I'm fully aware of it but uh, she kind of chose me can I just ask you a question Alison on behalf of all readers of The Independent who listen to Planet Normal of whom I'm sure there are many would this process of bringing back this cat (laughs) to Blighty massively expensive I'm sure would it be easier if we were now still in the EU (laughs) (laughs) As Turkey is uh, still remains outside the EU, no, it wouldn't be. But I was saying to Izzy, our producer, earlier that it's a lot easier to get an illegal migrant into the United Kingdom than it is to get a legal cat. Uh, it requires pet passport and jabs and all sorts. Um, but she is coming and she's called Didi, Didam, after the lovely vet who said to me that she didn't think she'd survive the winter. And there will be regular updates. We need to publish some <laughs> photos of said Turkish puss heading for the Lapis and Towers. So I came back and caused feeling very relaxed. And uh, then we were straight into one of the most upsetting stories I've covered in 30 years in journalism, which was the Lucy Letby verdict, the horrible discovery that this nurse had murdered seven babies and attempted to murder six more. I think Liam... One personal reason it affected me very deeply was many years ago now I did a big piece on the uh, NHS anniversary and I was privileged enough to be allowed to spend two days on the neonatal unit in the Royal London Hospital. 
It's where two of my kids were born. Yeah, and it's never left me. It's not like a ward. It's not like a hospital ward. It's more like a chapel. It's got intense quiet in there, and there are these creatures in the little incubators. I wouldn't call them babies, really. They're more like pencil sketches of humanity. That's what they're like. They are the tiniest and the most vulnerable creatures on God's earth. And it's amazing the expertise I saw of the nurses. I remember, always remember one young male nurse bending over this tiny, tiny baby and saying, you're all right, darling, no need to be scared. And it's never left me, Liam, to think that somebody, some monstrous person would go into that environment where it's all about getting them to live and inflict death on them was incredibly upsetting. But I think the column I wrote, in fact, I wrote two columns about it, but which you'd be able to have um, links to in the show notes. But really, there were two stories going on here. There was the obviously terrible tragedy of these babies being murdered. And there was this other story, which I think is the one that's going to run and run, of bureaucratic arrogance, absolutely hopeless, worse than hopeless management at the Countess of Chester NHS Trust. So basically, senior managers try to silence the doctors, accusing seven consultant paediatricians, if you will, of trying to cover up their own inadequacies by accusing Lucy Letby. And what this is about, Liam, it's about the NHS where reputation is all important. Stop doctors saying bad things about the hospital, even even if there's a suspicion that babies are dying. And I think we did see the apotheosis of a warped NHS culture, management in thrall to human resources, a culture that puts the well-being of the NHS and its senior management above the safety of patients. And the doctors who were saying this girl may be killing these babies had to do mediation with Lucy Letby and write a formal letter of apology to her for making her feel vulnerable and upset. So I did come down on it quite hard. It's really interesting to me, and also I think very important, that you began what you just said, your response to a story which I know touched you very, very deeply by lauding the Royal London. Yeah. Um, I know the hospital well. As I said, two of my kids were born there. Yeah. And we should just say it is most certainly our view and our experience. I've never given birth, but I was at the birth of my three children yeah. it's our view our strong view and our experience that the vast 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 majority of midwives and maternity staff in nhs hospitals are wonderful do a great job we're lucky to have them uh, and we should say that not just in fairness to them but also to calm the nerves of prospective mothers it's nervy enough when you're about to give birth as it is without being surrounded by headlines of a mass murdering person within the NHS, within a position of trust. So so we should say that. But I must say, I, I agree with you. I do think this has exposed a horrible culture of reputation management rather than running our NHS always and everywhere for the benefit of patients. And there can be no more vulnerable or important patients. This is literally the creation of life. This is literally the extension of our of our species. There's nothing more fundamental that goes on in society of any form than that. Mothers giving birth to tiny babies. It's it's absolutely ghastly that this has happened. And I've been pretty unimpressed by the political and the institutional response. It, you know, it wasn't long before that ghastly phrase, lessons must be learnt, was yeah. wielded. Is this going to be shoved into the long grass? Are we going to have some you know, Bloody Sunday style inquiry that goes on for, for decades. We need something urgent to be done here to try and expose why this happened. And a lot of the press has focused, rightly, I think, on the managers involved who, as soon as the implications of what Lucy Letby was doing started to become clear, you know, when she was was charged and, and, and so on, they just strolled on to another massive six-figure salary mm, job with mm. massive bonuses in another part of the country. That's crazy. That's completely the wrong incentive to be giving managers. If you take huge amounts of money in a salary, not least from the public sector when resources are so scarce, 
then you have to be accountable. You can't just carry on your career as if nothing's happened. This isn't musical chairs. This is life and death. But it is musical chairs. It's a cartel, Liam. And so I deliberately named in my column the senior members of the uh, Council of Chester management. Why shouldn't they be named? Let's get them out in the open with their vast pension pots and their uh, irresponsibility. And I talk particularly about Tony Chambers, who was the former chief executive of the Countess of Chester. The paediatricians, including Dr. Stephen Breary, said that Tony Chambers said to him that he was drawing a line under the case. And if the doctors crossed that line, there would be consequences. So they're basically being threatened with uh, being reported reported to the General Medical Council. And I'm hearing now I'm absolutely swamped with emails and conversations with whistleblowers telling absolutely chilling stories. And Liam, it's a fact that tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money are spent fighting doctors who are trying to reveal dangerous situations in the NHS. So basically, taxpayers' money funding the closing down of information that would be of benefit to taxpayers. It's about as warped as it could be. I asked a serving doctor at the Countess of Chester how he would describe Tony Chambers, the former chief executive. And we're going to use a technical term here, Halligan. He said he was a total gobshite. All right. And let's just remind ourselves, Bristol, Morecambe Bay, Mid-Staffs, East Kent, Shrewsbury and Telford. And coming soon, the mother of all maternity scandals, Nottingham, which is presently under investigation by Donna Ockenden, who's been a distinguished former guest on Planet Normal. And also, let's remember, Liam, that a mechanism for disbarment for serious misconduct was recommended by the 2019 CARC review. That meant that managers who were not doing their job could be struck off in a way similar to doctors. And the CARC review was rejected by NHS England and the government. And Matt Hancock, our old friend, said the plans were too complex to implement, or they do seem to be able to manage to strike off rogue doctors. So I think that some there will be some change. I think there absolutely has to be some change. And I think the public, as we've said many occasions now, I think the public waking up to these huge, huge problems within the NHS. And I've increasingly coming to the view that it is a totally failed uh, centralised Soviet-style management culture, which is taking power away from doctors. And doctors have been saying to me in the past week that they are told they can whistleblow, but they are far too scared to do so. Look, we will come back to this issue. Tony Chambers, of course, isn't here to defend himself. He would, I'm sure, deny the characterization that you have reported <laughs> of one of his former NHS colleagues. We should just say that. I mean, I also think we'll end up talking again about the way this case was used by some race baiters in a disgraceful way. Yeah. The idea that Lucy Letby could only get away with this because she was white. Quite astonishing logic and timing there by so-called activists who claim that. But let's move on to another really incredible story, though, very, very different. Uh, I thought the Spanish ladies deserved to win the World Cup final. I've got huge respect and pride for the Lionesses, who did so well. Uh, mm. I loved the cover of Private Eye, which showed the Lionesses sitting in the centre circle, having just lost uh, something along the lines of England's women's football team achieves equality with the boys. They're just <laughs> as disappointing as the men's team. <laughs> but come on, they got to a World Cup final. Absolutely fantastic. Crack on, girls. Let's get to the final again and let's try and win it next time. A brilliant performance. But anything that the Lionesses did was just, has just been completely blown away, hasn't it, by this incredible scandal. The mother of the head of the Spanish FA, she's now holed up in a church in Spain on hunger strike. So I hope that Planet Normal listeners know me well enough to know that I am the last person <laughs> who wants to see some idiot bloke cancelled for doing something ridiculous, all right? I have and had very strong reservations about the sort of the rush to judgment in Me Too 
And there was a, a movement which you could argue was long overdue, but which just basically had such a scattergun approach that, you know, sort of a serial abuser like Harvey Weinstein was bracketed with some dope from accounts who got a bit frisky on at the Christmas party. So I hope you, everyone, the listeners know that I'm certainly not going to be calling for people to be cancelled on. There's a buck coming. Entirely spurious. Yeah, so I looked at this case of Luis Rubiales and I thought, right, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at, at that medal ceremony. First of all, before, when they won the World Cup Spain, as you said, it was a, a dazzling performance, Liam. They just were on fire, those girls. It was incredible. And up in the box next to the Queen of Spain and the Princess of Spain was Luis Rubiales grabbing his crotch in a gesture that would be a bit unseemly from a 15-year-old boy, not, never mind the president of the Spanish Football Federation. And what happened, he explained at a press conference, Rubiales said that the coach, the women's team, Jorge Vilda, had dedicated the victory to him of the World Women's World Cup. And he, by grabbing his crotch, had indicated, it's a Spanish phrase, which has huevos, eggs in it, which basically means, no, your balls are as big as mine or bigger than mine. So we've got two blokes, Liam, <laughs> arguing or deciding which of them shall take the credit for the Spanish women, a squad of 23 women win winning the World Cup. Absolutely appalling attitude. And then during the medal ceremony, when the Queen of Spain was giving all the girls a lovely hug, very, very decorous, very full of pride. And then it came to him, and basically it wasn't just with uh, Jenny Homosa, which is the, what the case is about. Every single girl, he basically was like some handsy old uncle at a wedding, some old drunk. I thought it was mortifying. People have said, well, the girls didn't complain at the time. Well, you try being in that situation with the global spotlight on you, hundreds of millions of people watching. What are you supposed to do? Do, you know, knee him in the groin, which is what I would have done. Groin, that's quite a tame phrase for you so far on Planet Normal. Knee him in the huevos. <laughs> but the point is, is it a bit of an overreaction? Yes, probably it is. But, and I think a lot of people are now jumping on that bandwagon, left-wing politicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm, I'm going to say to you now, it's not woke, okay? It's not woke to care about good manners and decent behavior on an occasion like that. It's not woke to mind that this guy threw one of the Spanish women players over his shoulder, carrying a world-class athlete like he was some sort of Viking picking up some wench in a village. I am not hypersensitive to these things. And I watched that footage and I thought, you are a complete jerk, okay? So he behaved like a complete jerk. He should have said... I'm so sorry I got carried away. What I did was extremely inappropriate and I should be showing our women players a lot more respect. But I think his position is untenable because he is the he he's their boss. There's no other workplace in the world, Liam, where the boss could now grab a woman by the head and force a kiss on her. No other workplace. So that those are my feelings. And I'm sure, look, I know lots of the readers and listeners will have the opposite view. You've taken quite a bit of stick for this, haven't you? Below the line, as we say, where Telegraph readers so brilliantly give us so many comments on what we write, which are they're the lifeblood of, of what we do. Well, aren't I they? have, but just before you go on, all the Spanish <laughs> readers who've contributed, men and women, have agreed with me. All right? Spanish women, Spanish men have said, Alison is exactly spot on with what she's written. There is a culture of machismo and particularly in sport. And that's why he was treating the girls as if they were just sort of, you know, play things, not players. I mean, obviously, Luis Rubiales denies wrongdoing. He'd say he isn't a complete jerk. We should just say that. I think it's almost inevitable that he's going to lose his job, such as the sort of legions of ranked opinion and important figures in Spain going right up to the very apex of power involved. This has become an incredible story, not just because you've got elderly women on hunger strike. You've got parts of the Spanish FA suggesting to UEFA that they threaten to expel Spanish clubs from European competition. You've got the mighty Real Madrid and Barcelona getting involved with hundreds of millions of pounds and euros at stake across the men's and the women's game here. It's got completely out of hand. And I think that it will soon need to be drawn to some kind of close. But what do you think, Liam? Honestly, what do you think? Because I'm perfectly prepared 
to be told that I need to get a grip and that it was just a guy very excited and happy. I think Spain is very similar to a country I know well, which is Ireland. It's a country where front and centre, it is incredibly modern and liberal and European and progressive and so on, certainly in the big cities. But in the countryside, a patriarchy rules. There are many old-fashioned, conservative, Catholic views where little progress has been made since the 50s. And I'm talking about the 1850s, not necessarily the 1950s. So I do think there are very much, uh, it is a very delineated society. And I do think there are many views. But the trouble Rubiales has is that almost everyone who might be minded to defend him wouldn't dare because it's pretty clear that he's going to be removed from office, whatever you think of the details of the case. But let's move on because I do think we need to mention Yules, which yeah. isn't by no means just a London-centric story. Uh, an excellent Telegraph leader earlier this week said that Yules extension from central London, where it's been for a while, to the outer London suburbs and boroughs was greeted with fury and it was. There are polls that say the majority of Londoners want ULES, uh, but there's a mighty aversion to it among motorists where working people who drive their vans for a living, they're going to be hit with 12 and a half quid a day simply for taking their vans around the corner, uh, not even leaving their own neighbourhood to try and do their jobs and, and and make a living. And in that sense, it is regressive. You've got lots of high performance and antique cars that won't be charged. But if you are a white van man, you most definitely will be. And it's interesting politically that Sadiq Khan introduced this. He introduced it in the face of evidence suggesting that it wasn't going to do much at all to lower uh, nitrous oxide emissions and other mm. pollutant particles and so on. And we can talk about that, the role of Imperial College again there yeah. it is pretty shady, it seems to me. But it's not Sadiq Khan who seems to be getting the political blame. It's the Conservative government who are hiding behind some kind of legal advice that they can't get involved. And Keir Starmer's the same. He says, oh, I've got doubts about ULES. Everyone saw that Boris's old seat in Ryslip and Uxbridge where ULES is being extended. One of those outer London suburbs in West London in this case the Tories unexpectedly held on to Boris's seat because of sentiment against ULES. Even the Labour candidate in that seat was against the ULES extension. And Keir Starmer has said that Khan should think again. And yet Khan is going ahead, as I said, Alison, in the face of scientific evidence, which really doesn't support his case. It reminds me of, of lockdown, Liam, doesn't it? You know, these very stringent rules and restrictions placed on, you know, millions of, of people on very, very thin scientific advice. And that the evidence, as, as far as we know, we can talk about that, but the evidence just doesn't seem to be there. I mean, what, what's interesting, I mean, this, as you said, this is has implications for way outside London, not least because Angela Rayner, Labour deputy leader, has basically admitted that under a Labour government, this would be rolled out across the country. So it's not just the expansion this week of ULES to the outer London boroughs, but there's interestingly, there's resistance from the county councils in counties that are bordering ULES as well. So you've got Kent, Surrey and Hertfordshire absolutely refusing to put these cameras up. And I, I think, Liam, you can often tell, can't you, there's a sort of test with when policies are really bad, is I've had uh, numerous emails in the last few days from very respectable citizens indeed, retired banker this morning. They want to know about the cat. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to dominate your life. Mainly they want to know about the cat, but secondly, they're saying <laughs> they are on the side of the activists yep. who are going around taking down the cameras or spraying paint over them. Now, it seems to me that what we are facing here, there's a growing sense in this country that democracy and democratic process is being eroded. And I think there's more and more protests. And I think we were seeing in the ULES protests outside number 10 this week, it's not your usual suspects. It's not people with blue hair and green faces. It's respectable men and women, many of them pensioners who like to get in the old car and 
drive down to the pub for a mid-morning coffee. They can't afford £12.50 a day. Then you've got Sadiq Khan, who I find, I don't know what it is about him, absolutely insufferable, posing as a green crusader, and meanwhile treating all these people with older cars as a cash register to make millions of pounds. But let's just quickly mention, because I know you know a bit more about this than I do, but there was this science, wasn't there, which scientific evidence, which came out suggesting that the effect on pollution was absolutely minimal. And then we had this woman called Shirley Rodriguez, who I believe is Sadiq Khan's deputy mayor for the environment. Now, the London Authority is slipping Imperial College £800,000. And as far as I can deduce, Shirley Rodriguez and Sadiq Khan were not very happy with the scientific evidence, which suggested that ULEZ had minimal impact on pollution. I think he's claimed that it kills uh, 4,000 people a year in London, where it's only pollution has only ever appeared on one, a grand total of one death certificate. And so what did they do, Liam? They didn't like the scientific evidence, did they? Well, we know how ULEZ may operate because it's already operating in central London and a team at Imperial looked at the data, it's collected by hundreds of sensors across the capital, and they concluded that it had helped to lower NO2, nitrous oxide, as I said, levels by just 3% with Mm. a negligible effect on ozone and particulate pollution. So the evidence didn't seem to be there. So Shirley Rodriguez, as you said, the Deputy Mayor for the Environment and Energy, then commissioned another group at Imperial (laughs) to ask for their help in undermining the earlier study of their colleagues. What we've seen with the ULEZ extension, we've seen protests. We've seen pretty much the first big protests against net zero policies. The combination of the war in Ukraine and the implications of that for waking up the British people to the realities of our very fragile energy security, plus the ULEZ rollout and the response to that and the shenanigans surrounding it, I think they will be seen by future historians, those two things, as the lighting of a touch paper when the UK public said, look, we want less pollution, we want a clean environment for our kids, but we need to talk about how we do this, the pace at which we do this, and specifically where the cost of doing this falls. And in that sense, I think ULEZ, I don't think it will last, the extension, And I think it will be seen as really, really important because this has been rolled out in a really cack handed way. Oh, the science doesn't back up what we want to do. Let's get new science. That's an outrage. One of my all time favorite quotes was from the great Groucho Marx, where he said, uh, if you don't like my principles, I have others. <laughs> it's just, it's all in there. It's all in that sentence. It's all isn't in it? that sentence. I agree with you, Liam. I've become very exercised about the net zero targets, which I see the nation yet again shooting itself in the head after the lockdown disaster. And I think it was only a matter of time before the reality of what net zero means as opposed to the sort of nice touchy-feely, let's all have clean beaches and clean water and so on. Everyone can sign up to that. But now, as it starts to become clear that this is going to cost not just billions of pounds to have any hope of reaching net zero targets, which I think are unattainable anyway. We are talking trillions of pounds, which we don't have. And I do think, I mean, look, we're coming, we can talk about the government, we're coming into the home straight now, we're approaching the party conferences, the starting gun will effectively be fired, won't it, for the next election. And I think when we see small C conservatives actually out on the streets, respectable law abiding people resorting to direct action, because they are so furious, then you are looking, I think, at a poll tax moment. So let's talk about it, Alison. Let's talk about our nads. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, Nadine Dorries, the outgoing MP for Mid Bedfordshire, where she's built up a big majority. She's a popular local MP. Yeah. At least until recently, many would say, because recently she's barely been there. She's been doing other things. She's been delaying her resignation, hasn't she? Yeah. So to make sure that the by-election is timed to coincide there or thereabouts with the Tory party conference so as to do as much damage to Rishi Sunak 
as she can. She is, of course, a prominent supporter of Boris Johnson. Since you took office a year ago, she said in her mm. very public resignation letter, the country's run by a zombie parliament where nothing meaningful has happened. You have no mandate from the people and the government is adrift. Basically, that is a two word message. The second of which is off. Yes, I was going to make a joke about gonads, but that would be a bit Spanish of me, wouldn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, look, I think that Nadine Doris, I think she, you know, she's a proper blue collar conservative of the sort that gave Boris such a great majority. She speaks for a lot of people in this country. She's a former nurse. She's a, a self-made person. I have some issues with this lengthy resignation letter, which is big on indignation and obscures some of the key facts. She, I don't I think in the letter she says I'm really I'm really hacked off because you haven't given me my seat in the House of Lords which I think is partly what's motivated this attack on Rishi Sunak. I also think that you know she's famously a Boris Johnson head of the Boris Johnson fan club and I think that things were not tickety boo when Boris was forced out of number 10. Let's not forget Liam that there were scores of his own MPs and ministers who were refusing to serve under him. So I think this idea that it was all a dark conspiracy by Rishi Sunak is certainly open to question, but it will be this mid-Bedfordshire by-election in, as you say, the 97th safest Tory seat out of 365. It's going to be very, very interesting. And I think we have a government which is rudderless, burnt out, exactly as the Conservatives were. That's the state they were in in 1997, although there's no Tony Blair waiting in the wings. And I think what we see at the moment is absolutely, it's a, I was thinking it's like one of those closing down sales in a rug shop, isn't it? It's kind of like, you want a policy on asylum seekers? Right, let's announce a GPS tag. You want us to look tough on crime? Let's announce that prisoners are going to be dragged into the dock to be sentenced. I mean, every other day now. Cones hotline, anyone? <laughs> it is exactly, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> to evoke a, a policy from the major era, <laughs> Cones Hotline. Do you do you see what I'm saying? That it's just that, that they're just sort of some, somebody is saying, "My God, we've got to come up with a policy for this." I agree with Nadine Doris. There does seem to be no guiding plan at all. They've run out of vision. I think many of them have given up, and hence party discipline now is really, really collapsing. So I think that the next few weeks and months are. Extremely interesting. And certainly what Nadine said about the, the Prime Minister lacking, there's no affection for Keir Starmer on the doorstep, that Starmer doesn't have X factor quality of a Thatcher, a Blair or a Johnson. And sadly, Prime Minister, neither do you. And she's saying that Sunak's actions have left some 200 or more of my MP colleagues to face an electoral tsunami and the loss of their livelihoods. So certainly scoring some points there. Well, Nadine Dorries herself may well be soon on The X Factor or some other reality TV show. You'd get very long odds now on the Tories winning the next general election. But if her mid-Bedfordshire majority of 24,664 is overturned and the Tories lose that seat, which they may well, astonishingly, then the odds on any Tory general election victory would get even longer. Women's football, Euro final, England versus Germany, Wembley, sold out stadium, and then to go on and win it. It was just insane. A lot of the chatter afterwards was, I really hope it's not the ACL, hope it's everything else. I'd worked in the Olympic and Paralympic system for a number of years. No one had ever said the word periods. No one had talked about menstrual cycles. I've totally subscribed to best person for the job, but often the best person for the job could well be a female, but society isn't ready for that yet. All I'm saying is that everybody should know how to swim. I can't fathom how you can try and say that that is troublemaking or anything like that. Every time I hear somebody talk about investing in women's sport and talking about it as if it's some sort of donation <laughs> or like charity. <laughs> You're welcome. It's just such a weird way to tell me that you're bad at business. The Telegraph Women's Sport Podcast with me, Sam Quek. Follow now so you don't miss an episode. For many years, Reverend Richard Fothergill was a satisfied customer of the Yorkshire Building Society, as had been his father. Asked for feedback by the Yorkshire, 
he sent a response to their promotion of LGBTQIA plus Pride Month back in June, asking if such a promotion was a good use of the Building Society's time and money. And as a Church of England minister, Reverend Fothergill also politely expressed his concern shared by millions of many faiths and none about the impact of what he called transgender ideology on children. Two weeks later, Reverend Fothergill received what he described as a rather sharp letter from the Yorkshire Building Society stating, quote, your comments will not stand. We must protect our workforce from prejudice. The relationship between us has irrevocably broken down, the Yorkshire added, and Reverend Fothergill lost his account, as did former UKIP leader Nigel Farage, of course, when he was debanked by NatWest subsidiary Coots. The case of Richard Fothergill intrigued your Planet Normal co-pilots, so we asked him onto the rocket. No longer a parish priest, he started by explaining his current role within the Church of England. No, that's right. I mean, I was a parish priest in three different parishes, including one in South Africa, uh, for 14 years. Um, I was ordained in 1995 in London. I'm ordained Anglican priest. And so I've done that. I understand parish ministry and the stresses and strains of that. But currently, I'm leading a ministry called The Filling Station, which is a non-denominational ministry all over the country. We've got about 80 filling station meetings that meet each month. And they meet in village halls and other locations, not church buildings, really. And um, about 4,000 people go to a filling station each month. And it's, it's really just an opportunity for Christians to express their faith, have some worship, have some teaching, have some prayer, and so on. And uh, it, it seems to be quite popular. It seems to be growing. Now, you and your wife, Josephine, you are real fans of Planet Normal. You've written to us over the months and years. And when you wrote to us about the way that you were debanked, both Alison and I thought, this is really, really interesting we really need to talk to Richard to learn more. So what can you tell us about that experience? Well, it was a bit of a surprise, really. I had a savings account with the Yorkshire Building Society for 17 years, and uh, they'd always been very good. They're a very good bank, and they'd given a good rate of interest. And when we sold our house once, we put quite a lot of the money from that into that account. I've been obviously with Yorkshire quite a while. I'm part Yorkshire myself, and I know my father had a... Yorkshire Building Society account, if not two, in fact, my late father. So Yorkshire has just been sort of part of the furniture, really. Well, I've noticed over the years that they send, their customer relations department sends out messages to all their members. I think they've got three million members or something. Every month they send out a message and invariably it would say things like, tell us how we're doing and we want to hear from you, our members, this kind of stuff. And usually it just goes into the junk file, don't take any notice. But I noticed at the beginning of June, they had started to put on their masthead on their website and with these, these messages coming through, the transsexual flag. And they were obviously doing a very big push on pushing LGBTQAA+. Are there any more letters? I don't know. They're pushing Pride Month for June. And I thought, well, you know, they, they're always asking for opinions. Shall I give them one? So I wrote back on their portal, fairly straightforward, two paragraph piece. I just had two points. I said, first of all, you seem to be putting an awful lot of energy into this and money and people's time, I imagine, to push LGBTQ Pride Month. Why don't you just focus on managing the money, which you do well? You know, is this really good for your brand to push this social group? And then the second point I had was, as I said, as a, a minister in the church, and I signed the Reverend Richard Fothergill, so I knew where I was coming from, I personally have strong ethical problems with some aspects of transsexualism, particularly in reference to where they want to have access to our children and to sexualize our children. I said, you know, you don't need to do this. As I said, as a member, I have a concern about it. And that's all I said, really. It, I politely put, I honestly thought they're just going to bin it. They won't take any notice of this. I thought the best that could happen would be if a hundred other people were like me, their members, wrote into them and say, look, please don't push Gay Pride Month. You know, you just focus on money, managing money. I thought maybe the next year the marketing department would say to them, you know, let's just sit light on Gay Pride June, shall we? Anyway, so nothing happened for two weeks. Then I got a letter, quite a sharp letter back from them saying strange things like, your comments will not stand, which I thought was quite a sort of 
a Victorian phrase, really. It's the sort of thing you might hear Plantagenus Palliser saying in the House of Commons, Sir, your comments will not stand, this sort of thing. And uh, say, we must protect our staff from discrimination, which I think meant from me. And say, we're going to cancel your account. Got two weeks and then we're going to close your account. This is after 17 years of being with them. Oh, they also said things like, it's clear that the relationships between the two of us have irrevocably broken down, which is news to me. The thing is, they'd asked for an opinion and I'd given them an opinion. It was just the wrong one. And so they took the opportunity to close my account. And they didn't, it didn't justify. They didn't sort of say what specifically I'd done wrong, my crime, other than these vague assertions that they must protect their staff from me, really. I said they got, gave me two weeks' notice. And I've discovered subsequently they, they actually broke the law on that because they're meant to give anybody 60 days' notice if they're going to close their account. And they also need to justify as to why they're doing it, which they didn't do with the letter to me. So, you anyway, so that's, that's how we got into this situation in June. And sure enough, two weeks later, they closed it and they sent me a check. There wasn't much money in there. And that's that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm out the door. They've got rid of me. And then, of course, the case of Nigel Farage really came to the fore where he was debanked. He was able to appoint swishy lawyers who could do a subject access request. Coots, owned by NatWest, then had to hand over a 40-odd page dossier that was basically all about why he was such a bad man and why they didn't want to be associated with him. Then you had the spectacle of the chief executive of NatWest saying certain things to a BBC journalist that weren't actually true. They didn't close his account down at Coots because he didn't have enough cash. They closed his account down because they didn't like, shall we say, the cut of his jib. Let's dig a little bit deeper, if I may, Reverend Richard. You strike me in your writing, in, in the discussions that we've had, you know, you are a pretty altruistic, live and let live kind of person. You don't strike me as a sort of hectoring character. You clearly have very, very strong Christian beliefs and more power to your elbow. Many millions of people in this country do. What is it specifically that really clearly wound you up about what the Yorkshire were doing in promoting certain lifestyles? Because in your emails to me, you've really stressed your fears about access to female spaces, access to to children, and so on. It it strikes me that that is really where you're coming from. Well, yes, certainly it's the the sexual ethics side. And as you say, Liam, obviously I'm coming at it from a traditional Christian approach, sort of Judeo-Christian tradition, that there are only two genders, there aren't 56 genders or 100 genders, as the BBC seem to think. Uh, There are two, there are male and female, and most particularly this idea that you shouldn't try to sexualise children until they come into their majority, until they come through puberty. And of course, all the way through as children and then as teenagers, you actually need to give them assurance and guidance that, that is affirming of life and truthful. And it strikes me very much that the transsexualism, as is now very much talked about in, in the West, is an ideology. Gender dysphoria is a, is a completely separate thing and extremely rare. But most of the people who are pushing the transsexual ideology seem to be activists who want to sort of suggest, and particularly in my, my letter to Yorkshire, I did actually reference in this area the link with Drag Queen Story Hour, which I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's an import from the States and where drag queens, men dressed up as women, essentially go into libraries and go into schools and read stories to children. And and part of the intention is to get the young minds to think that any variation is possible, that maybe 56 genders or whatever, and get them to thinking about it young. Now, actually, that, that, to my mind, is really a sort of child abuse. They need to be protected from that. There are lots of laws in this country to protect minors under 16 from exploitation like that. And so that was my uh, theological and Christian approach to it. That's why I, I wanted to assert my opinion. When they asked for it, that's the whole point. They asked for an opinion they just got an opinion which they didn't like a look of because they're so enthralled, I believe, to Stonewall or whoever who've been saying you must push LGBTQ or sort of queer theory and uh, to you know, be a, a modern organisation, you've got to buy into this particular ethical, sexual ethical package. Is it hard being a Christian these days? I speak as somebody 
who, in my extended Irish family, there are many people of the Catholic faith, as you can imagine, with a surname like mine. And, and I see, and I see in, in the land of my fathers, if you like, religion is really getting a hard time from the younger generation. Not so much from the media, where there's still a lot of respect for the church, but it strikes me that their respect for the church here in the UK is really thin on the ground. And you are here clearly practicing your very devoutly held vocation. You're doing a, a lot of great work on the ground, altruistic work, supporting people. Do you feel oppressed as somebody who's trying their very best to spread Christian values? I, I ask you in all good faith. No, I don't actually at all, because I suppose the sort of version of Christianity I have very much focuses on obviously teaching Jesus' teaching. He said, you will be opposed. You, you must expect this. This is part of the package. In a sense, we in Britain and in much of the West have actually been living off 1500 years of Christendom, where essentially the Christian story, the Christian narrative has been the majority view and has, been, has set the culture. One of the reasons why we are the way we are in Britain is actually due to our deep and rich Christian heritage. And it, but it's only in our generation, my generation, that actually that's now being attacked and questioned. And obviously there are particularly humanistic groups that are having a go at it. But I expect that. So I don't find it being difficult to Christian at all, actually, because this is part of normal package. Through our work at the Fling Station, we've linked up with a, a group called Open Doors, who are based in Whitney in Oxfordshire, who have been for many years now analysing the persecuted church globally. And um, basically everything that goes on in Britain or the West through a little bit of criticism and debanking is as nothing compared to the vast majority of Christians around the world, particularly in, in China, in Middle Eastern countries and so on, that are actively persecuted. So in that regard, I don't find it difficult. Also, another, another point I'd like to highlight, my experience of the church in Britain is that it's only ever grown. All the organizations and groups and Church of England parishes I've been involved with, we've only ever seen growth. We've seen new people coming to faith. We've seen people being uh, encouraged, comforted, built up in their existing faith. And particularly about the young, actually, we see a lot of young who actually who are fed up with uh, the answers that the world's been trying to give them for life and are actually looking to some answers in Christ Jesus. So uh, I don't feel oppressed. I don't feel uh, hard pressed in any way. And actually, uh, it's just if that does happen, it's just a small minor thing. It just comes with the territory, really. Do you think the debate is shifting here, Reverend Richard? For instance, a couple of years ago, Planet Normal interviewed the British swimmer, Sharon Davis, who you'll be aware of. And at the time, when we first interviewed her, she was putting out views there which were really pilloried when she was pointing out the unfairness of female-born athletes competing against male-born athletes who were competing as females. And she had a certain moral authority because people of sort of our age remembered when she lost out, being such an incredible young swimmer, she lost out to drug cheats from the former Eastern Bloc, particularly East Germany. And because of her moral authority and her sort of athletic status, she was able to speak out. But since then, her views, which have been really marginalised, are now increasingly coming to the fore. And we're seeing sports like swimming, like rugby, like rowing, like cycling, who are, if you like, pushing back against this all-pervasive trans ideology. And I've seen things change in the last few months that I personally thought would take a lot longer to change. I'm seeing governing bodies in various walks of life getting a bit more backbone, pushing back. Even the civil service now under duress in many cases, but they're starting to push back against you know the absolute um, necessity of having 10 gold stars from Stonewall, if you like. Don't you think this debate is on the move? Does that empower you? Does that make you bolder? Does that make you feel that it's right for you to be speaking out? Indeed, it's definitely there's been a sea change. And I really would say within the last year. And I think at last, uh, normal people uh, in every walk of life, and not necessarily just people of, of faith at all, are pushing back and saying, no, come on, reality. Let's have some reality here. There are males and there are females. That's it. You know, if you as a male really think it's important to dress up as a woman and present yourself as a woman, 
you aren't a woman. You've got X and Y chromosomes all through your body. You will always be male. And so it's an ideology. So Sharon was absolutely right, because obviously one of the ways in which this is most damaging is in the whole area of women's sports. But there is a pushback going on, as we've seen things like the, you know, the Athletics Association sort of saying, no, transsexuals, men, biological men cannot compete in women's sports. I think it just needs the, the majority of us just to stand up and say, no, you're wrong. This isn't going to work. This isn't truthfulness. This isn't reality. And, and it's not in any way sort of oppressing some hard, oppressed little minority by saying that. This is not the same kind of issue as elsewhere of a minority that hasn't been heard until now. This is actually wholly an ideologically driven thing, in my view. So, yes, it, I suppose it makes me bolder, but I'm not on a campaign. Uh, my job is to build the Church of Jesus Christ. And so, yes, if I have an opportunity to speak out, if that's what I have to do, I'm very happy to do it. Reverend Richard Fothergill, thanks a lot for joining us. On Planet Normal. So there we have it, Alison, Reverend Richard Fothergill having his say here on the Rocket of Right Thinking. And we should add that a spokesman for Yorkshire Building Society told Planet Normal, while we do not comment on individual cases, we never close savings accounts based on different opinions, beliefs or feedback provided by our customers. It's extremely rare, said the Yorkshire, that we have to make the difficult decision to close accounts and we only ever close a savings account if a customer is rude, abusive, violent, or discriminates in any way based on the specific facts, comments, and behavior in each case. I was delighted to hear that the Reverend Richard and his wife Josephine are huge Planet Normal fans. They've been listening right from spring of 2020. I'm clearly very, very charming and thoughtful people. And I think the idea that the Yorkshire Building Society should write to this lovely vicar and say, your comments will not stand. We must protect our workforce from prejudice. Whose prejudice must they protect their workforce from? And aren't they supposed to be serving the customer? So I think that this is, you know, we're seeing, as you quoted, Liam, Nigel Farage and Coots, we're seeing these institutions, banks, civil service, losing touch with what they actually exist for. I mean, they are supposed to be serving the user, the people who literally, in Richard's case, literally paying his money. And it is quite astonishing. And I think, I know that you raised the matter in the interview about Richard. Of course, he's a, he's a very strong Christian and he has Christian views. But I don't think those are just Christian views. I bet most Planet Normal listeners, and in fact, the majority of the population, don't want young children being indoctrinated with a trans ideology, which we know has been leading to puberty blockers. Only last week, Liam, surprise, surprise, puberty blockers aren't good for children. I mean, who could have guessed that? So I think that this isn't just about people of faith. It's about people of no faith and all faiths. You know, many of the world's religions, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, would be appalled at the abuse of children, which is applied here. And I want to know where does this society get off? We have a day a year, Armistice Day, which commemorates the service and the deaths of men and women in two world wars. We now have a month, <laughs> a pride month for LBGTQ. And how has that happened? And, and I don't believe it comes from the majority, Liam. I think it's an aggressive minority, which is foisting very, very cleverly insinuating itself into the policies of banks like Coots, like the Yorkshire Building Society, and people like Richard, who are speaking for the vast majority of their fellow countrymen, expressing completely understandable reservations about why his bank is supporting this minority cause. And these people fall foul of it. And I just don't know what the way forward is, but I'm very glad. Thank you, Richard, for being brave enough to speak out. And thank you for fighting back for the normal people. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We learn so much from you, citizens of Planet Normal. Now, this is an unbelievable email. I'm in touch, Liam, with the current medic at the Countess of Chester Hospital where those babies were murdered by Lucy Letby. 
The number of clueless non-entities in senior positions in NHS trusts is unbelievable. They are obsessed with reputational management and preoccupy themselves with empire building, wasting time on the plethora of talking shops and obsess over bureaucracy and process to ensure that under no circumstances does anything get done. This all takes place to an absurd soundtrack of vacuous slogans, open and inclusive, transparent, reaching out to key stakeholders. Those slogans rung alongside absurd gimmicks and virtue signalling. It's like observing the leader of a cult who ruthlessly attack any heresies that deviate from the theology of true believers. It wouldn't be out of place in a dystopian novel, but it's anything but fiction, I'm afraid. The reality is that Lucy Letby could have happened in many NHS hospital trusts because fundamentally the leaders of this cult think they are untouchable. Astonishing that that came from a doctor at the very hospital trust where Lucy Letby worked. This is from Clive responding to Alison's piece on the Spanish kiss. Normally I'd agree with you, Alison, but not on this. The whole thing's been a massive overreaction from social media wokes who want to destroy a man who was simply perhaps too exuberantly celebrating a World Cup victory. Nobody's denying he went over the top, but the reaction has been massively disproportionate, says Clive. I'm surprised at you for supporting <laughs> this feminist nonsense. Really, I thought you had more insight. That's you told, Alison. Crikey, I would, I'm so glad Clive wrote that because you'd box my ears <laughs> if I said that to you. <laughs> you'd set the Turkish tiger on me. My Turkish puss. And then we had this from Sarah, Alison, who actually supported you. As I watched Luis Rubiales kiss Jenny Hermoso, I was shocked especially after he'd picked up another player and threw her over his shoulder. My immediate thought was that they were in a relationship and that he'd just revealed it live to the world. And would she be OK with that? It just felt all wrong. I also happened to see his press conference and again was shocked by his aggressive, shouty manner. I'm not surprised there have been numerous resignations. He's clearly unfit to be around women, but how sad the media storm is about him and not about the Spanish team's impressive achievement of winning the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. And so on that bombshell of Telegraph readers split over whether Alison Pearson is woke or not, <laughs> that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week, Alison, it's your call. Go on, give it to Clive. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> In the spirit of unwokeness and yet mutual solidarity, Clive, it's you. Yay! <laughs> I didn't railroad you to that by any means, did I? So, Clive, send us an email to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Alison's so shocked she just did that. She's coughing. She can barely catch I her can breath. can barely catch my Put breath. Put in the email subject heading mug winner. Give us your postal address and we will send you a rare as rocking horse poo Planet Normal mug. If you enjoy Planet Normal and agree that Alison Pearson is not woke, please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. They do cheer up the co-pilot. Who'd have thunk it? Uh, who'd have thunk it? Wokey <laughs> Pants Pearson. Crikey. <laughs> and as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampett, Cass Ho and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other until next week. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him.